This is Dr. Mohamed Megri. Today we'll summarize the ATS and IDSA guidelines about community-acquired pneumonia diagnosis and treatment. We will apply these guidelines step-by-step step on our patient. We received a call from the emergency department about a 43-year-old male who presented to the emergency department complaining of progressive dyspnea, productive cough, and chills for the last four days. Otherwise, he denied any other symptoms. He denied any prior hospitalization, IV antibiotic use, or any travel history. His review of systems were negative, and on presentation, his blood pressure was 121 over 76, and he didn't require any fluid resuscitation. Heart rate was regular, and it was 100 beat per minute. Respiratory rate was 21 breath per minute. The patient was febrile with a temperature of 101 Fahrenheit. Oxygen saturation on room air was 98%. On general exam, the patient was alert, oriented. He was mildly dyspneic and tachypneic, but he wasn't in acute distress, and he didn't require any oxygen supplement. His cardiac exam was unremarkable, but pulmonary exam was significant for crackles at the left lower zone. Otherwise, his exam was normal. On presentation, blood workup was obtained. CBC was remarkable for white blood cell count 13.7, but he wasn't anemic, and there's no thrombocytopenia, and his hematocrit was normal. Electrolytes and creatinine were normal, but the blood urine nitrogen was 24 mg per deciliter. Brucalcitonin was obtained as well, and it was 0.6. Then we reviewed the chest X-ray that was obtained in the emergency department, which shows there is left lower lobe infiltrate in PA and lateral view. By looking at the patient presentation and the chest X-ray changes, what do you think the diagnosis is? That's right, this patient has community-acquired pneumonia. Then what's the next step? The resident who is taking care of this patient has many questions, such as, should we obtain blood cultures? Should we obtain sputum cultures and nasal PCR? Should we do urine original antigen and strep pneumonia antigen? Should we treat the patient empirically without obtaining any cultures? Should we add MRSA coverage, pseudomonas coverage? Should we treat the patient as an inpatient or outpatient? The ATS and IDSA guidelines that was published recently in October 2019 they addressed all of these questions and they make it easy to follow and to understand. Let us try to follow these guidelines on our patient. The first question we need to answer is if our patient has prior respiratory isolation of MRSA or Pseudomonas. If the answer was yes, the patient has a prior history of MRSA infection, then we need to obtain blood culture, sputum culture, nasal PCR, and empirically cover for MRSA infection by using vancomycin or linozolid. Then you can de-escalate or continue the same antibiotics if you confirm with the blood culture. Which is the same for the pseudomonas. If the patient has any prior respiratory isolation of pseudomonas, then we need to obtain blood culture, sputum culture, and empirically cover for pseudomonas by using cefepime or zosin or azetronem. Then you can de-escalate or confirm according to the culture. That's why we asked our patient and we asked his family and we looked up in the medical records, we found that our patient has never had any MRSA or Pseudomonas infection before. Then what's the next step? The next step we need to define if our patient has severe community acquired pneumonia or not. The 2019 guidelines, they use the 2007 criteria for severe community acquired pneumonia. And the criteria are, if the patient has one point of the two major criteria, which is septic shock with need for vasopressors, or respiratory failure with the need of mechanical ventilation, then the patient qualify for severe community acquired pneumonia. Or if the patient has three points of the minor criteria, which are, confusion or altered mental status, respiratory rate equal or more than 30 breath per minute, hypotension that require fluid resuscitation, hypothermia with a temperature less than 36 degree, PO2 FI2 ratio equal or less than 250, leukopenia with white blood cell count less than 4000, 
and it has to be second to the pneumonia, not to something else like use of chemotherapy or other medication can lead to leukopenia or any other diseases. Uremia with blood urine nitrogen equal or more than 20 mg per deciliter and low platelet less than 100 and if the patient has multilobar infiltrate on chest x-ray or CT scan. If the patient has one point of the major criteria or three points of the minor criteria, then the patient can be defined as severe community-acquired pneumonia. Let us see if our patient qualify for severe community-acquired pneumonia or not. Our patient was not in septic shock, nor respiratory failure, so he's not qualified for the major criteria. Then if you look at the minor criteria, our patient, he wasn't confused, his respiratory rate was 21, he was normotensive and he didn't require any fluid resuscitation, he was uh, febrile with a temperature of 101 Fahrenheit, his oxygen saturation in room air was 98%, his white blood cell count was 13.7, his blood urine nitrogen was 24 mg per deciliter. Then now we have one point, his platelet were normal and he has only one lube infiltrate. Now we have only one point of the minor criteria, then our patient has non-severe community-acquired pneumonia. But let us say if the patient has severe community-acquired pneumonia, then what's the next step? The next step is we have to obtain blood culture, sputum culture, urine legionella antigen, and urine strep pneumonia antigen. And we need to confirm if that patient who has the severe community-acquired pneumonia was recently hospitalized and received IV antibiotics in the last 90 days, and there is locally validated risk factors for MRSA and or Pseudomonas. If the answer was yes, then we need to empirically cover our patient for MRSA and or Pseudomonas, then we can de-escalate or continue the antibiotics according to the culture. But if the answer was no, the patient have never been hospitalized or he received antibiotics, but it was more than 90 days ago, then we need to cover our patient with beta-lactam plus macrolids or beta-lactam plus fluoroquinolones. Now we know to decide to start MRSA or pseudomonas coverage in severe community-acquired pneumonia, it depends on these three points. But we mentioned that our patient has non-severe community-acquired pneumonia, then what's the next step? Do we have to obtain cultures and get urine legionella and strep pneumonia antigen? The answer is no. We don't have to obtain any cultures or urine antigen. We can treat our patient empirically with the use of beta-lactam plus macrolids or fluoroquinolones by itself. The only condition that we need to obtain cultures in non-severe community-acquired pneumonia if the patient was hospitalized before this presentation and received IV antibiotics in the last 90 days and there is locally validated risk factors for MRSA and or pseudomonas. Then we need to obtain blood culture, sputum culture, and nasal PCR, but we continue the same antibiotic till we get the culture back, then we can escalate or de-escalate our antibiotics accordingly. The other condition was mentioned in this guidelines about if the physician has any suspicion for abscess or embyema. If the patient has recurrent aspiration and you obtain chest x-ray or CT scan, you found abscess or embyema, then you can add anaerobic coverage, and it was conditional recommendation. Then the other question was addressed in these guidelines, whether we can use brucalcitonin to define if this patient has viral or bacterial infection, and the answer was no. You need to use your clinical sense and the radiological changes in combination with the patient history and exam to decide if the patient needs to be treated with antibiotics or not. That's why we cannot use brucalcitonin to define if this patient has viral or bacterial pneumonia. The other question that was answered by these guidelines, how can we decide if we're gonna treat our patient as an inpatient or outpatient? As we know, there is two scores that we can use, pneumonia severity index for community acquired pneumonia and CURB-65, which stand for C, confusion, U, uremia, R for respiratory uh, rate, B for pressure, and 65 for the age equal or more than 65. But the new guidelines, they prefer the pneumonia severity index over the CURB-65. 
we tried to put our patient criteria in the pneumonia severity index and it came back our patient has risk class one and outpatient treatment is reasonable and we tried to put the criteria in the curve 65 and we found that he has only one point which is the blood urine nitrogen and our patient can be treated as an outpatient but as we mentioned the new guideline they preferred the pneumonia severity index compared to curb 65. If we summarize our patient, our patient has symptomatic community acquired pneumonia, no prior hospitalization or IV antibiotic use, he was hemodynamically stable, and he didn't qualify for severe community acquired pneumonia. Then our patient has non severe community acquired pneumonia and there was no prior respiratory MRSA or pseudomonas infection, and our patient has never been hospitalized or received any IV antibiotics, then how should we treat our patient? We should treat him with beta-lactam plus macrolids or fluoroquinolones by itself without obtaining any cultures or adding MRSA or pseudomonas coverage. Thank you for listening. Please review the guidelines after watching this video.